Hey everybody, um, it's weird not being able to see everyone, but I can see Aura and Chelsea. Um, so hey ladies, how are you? Good, good. Yeah, um, good Aura looks so you. worried. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be okay, it's going to be good. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, it will be. Okay, it's so good to actually be able to link up um, and talk especially about the thing that holds us all together that we had in common that brought us together, which is um, university, our university experience at Cambridge. Um, we were all in the same year together. Um, and I think we should just hop straight into introducing ourselves. So I uh, will pick Aura to go first. Introduce okay. yourself, tell us about you, your experience, um, or yeah, just tell us about you actually. We'll, we'll leave experience till later. Okay. So hello everyone, my name is Aura, Aura Ogunbi. I am 23. I graduated from Jesus College, Cambridge in 2018. And I studied human, social and political sciences, specializing in politics and international relations. Yes, gang gang, best subject ever. <laughs> um, and I um, went on to do a master's at Columbia Journalism School. So uh, that was for a year just after I graduated. And I now work in Nigeria as a special assistant to the vice president and policy research which I love so Amazing. I'm currently in Nigeria. love it love it Chelsea please tell us about your lovely self so hi everyone my name is Chelsea Chelsea Kwachi I was at Homerson College and yes I graduated alongside Aura and Courtney in 2018 um, ever since then, I've been doing the um, GDL and LPC. So that's essentially a, just a law conversion course and then the legal practice course. Uh, and I've actually just finished my second week um, um, at my new job. So I've just started a training contract with um, a city law firm, which has been good so far. But yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Um, I'm Courtney Daniela Boating. I went to or graduated from Robinson College in 2018 as well, having studied human, social and political science uh, sciences. Um, I specialised in sociology with social psychology. Um, and upon graduating, I started my own beauty company. And I have been doing that for the last two years, as well as being a digital content creator um, for the last four years. So that is pretty much me in a nutshell. What these two ladies did not mention is that they are the fabulous authors of Taking Up Space. <laughs> but yeah, please tell us about, um, I guess we will start from the beginning. Tell us about your experience at university and why it led to you wanting to and going on to write Taking Up Space. Um, so I think, I mean, my experience at university, I think, was bittersweet. You know, I have a lot of great memories from Cambridge, and I think I choose to focus on those where possible. But um, there are a lot of harsh realities and things that I had to come to terms with at Cambridge um, in just kind of very, like, extreme ways. So I think it was a very... Um, it was probably the first time that I really realised how much I was othered just by being Black. And I didn't go into Cambridge with a mindset really expecting that. You know, I'd come from, I went to private school and, but I went to private school that was actually really quite diverse. And I think there was just quite a shock of coming to Cambridge and my college. And despite how large my college being, being one of three black girls in my whole year. Right. Um, and so I think there was a real sense of imposter syndrome. There was a real, I think the imposter syndrome actually started from the interview stage. I think, I, you know, I talk mm. about that taking up space a lot, but I would say my experience was bittersweet. There were lots of highs, lots of lows. Um, I obviously got to meet lots of people like you guys and make good friendship groups and also was pushed academically. Like I don't, I don't take that for granted at all. Like I really had a great academic experience for the most part. Um, but I think there were definitely still some things to be desired, but we're gonna talk about that in a bit more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I How think about so, yourself, Chelsea? Yeah, I think for me it was exactly the same that. I think especially as we were writing Taking Up Space, it's a lot easier to remember the really bad times or the really good times, if that makes sense, because those are the highs and the lows of your whole experience at university. Um, but I don't know, I've, I think since we've graduated, I've spent a lot of time just reflecting and thinking like, wow, those three years, one, went really fast, but also two, a lot happened. And yeah. I think... It wasn't, a, it wasn't a normal or usual university experience. Um, but I think what kind of led us to write Taking Up Space was the fact that we were in this situation as young black women that was so unique, but mm -hmm. 
but to us in this bubble it all it seemed very normal that that was our normal and I think Ore and I and again why we had contributors in the book as well we wanted everybody to see that this is what we go through on a day-to-day something that is really unique but people need to know because we speak about these issues all the time but nobody really gets an insight into how how it feels and what it's really like um but I was the same I mean for me my imposter syndrome I'd say even started before the interview stage in terms of I so I went to a state school and my teachers didn't really know what was going on I remember we had I had one interview which was a bit weird a bit odd um and then that was it and then I was just shipped off to to go to this Cambridge interview and um from then on and again I speak about that in the book as well Mm. that was I already knew that this was some somewhere that probably wasn't for me which is odd because I ended up there anyway but (laughs) right so then both of you have mentioned imposter syndrome um and you talk about it like you said or a lot in taking up space especially in the chapter called um finding spaces and so explain to us um your experiences with imposter syndrome and how um environments or spaces like Cambridge or other universities can do better to help students battle that feeling and really overcome that feeling. So we'll start with you, Aura, again. So I think, um, so imposter syndrome is this kind of idea that even though I've earned my place there, I just felt this kind of overwhelming sense of inadequacy, this sense of I'm not supposed to be here. Um, maybe it's some massive mistake. And they always right. say that at the beginning, like everyone has some kind of degree of imposter syndrome. You're all new. We actually, I remember we had a talk from the porters at the beginning and, you know, I, that was the first time I actually had heard the term imposter syndrome. But mm. I had to think, and I think what we kind of talk about in the book is the specific ways in which it affects you as a black woman in right. a space that has historically not included people like you. We talk about women not being let into Cambridge until like the 60s, but then also, well, how many black people have really been going to Cambridge before you know, the past kind of couple of decades as well. So it's a very, it's, it's literally built into the walls. Like we say things, you know, uh, I I spent a lot of my time at Cambridge fighting for the repatriation of of the Benin bronze crock rule, which means a lot to the people of Benin. And I had to kind of constantly make this case of celebrating stolen colonial loots is not really where we're trying to be today. And I had to make that case a gazillion times. And I had to walk into that, our dining hall, where that cockle would sit every day, and the building itself, the, the room itself, with all the pictures of all the white men sitting around me and watching me eat my dinner, and the cockle sitting right there, it's just this glaring reminder that this was not a space that was for you. This is not a space that you really have any ownership over or that you have any right. claim to. Um, and I think that's kind of what the experience is. But it's also even in things like um, what you're studying you're not seeing people like you reflected in what you're studying and who is teaching you. Um, I think that's really important. I had one black woman teach me a couple lectures in my third year and another one, a few sociology lectures in my second year, but most people go their whole um, uni careers without being taught by a black woman at all. And I think right. that's a big deal. It's a, it's a countrywide problem, but again, it contributes to this imposter syndrome and this feeling of this place isn't for you. People like you mm. don't excel to that level here. Mm. You're right. more like to see more people working as cleaners and as bedders and as porters that are black than you are to see academics and that's an issue so yeah in terms of what more the university can be doing um i mean listening to us and we're making arguments about things like why cockles need to be taken down why who we more who we memorialize on our walls is important um and who is contributing to these conversations about what we're studying who's teaching um even who you're giving scholarships and things to um, mm. have a conversation around access and who we're letting in and and um, who we think is deserving of a place and, and what that looks like. It's a massive conversation, but I think universities need to just start, and especially Cambridge, need to start by listening. Um, they're mm. doing better than they were when we were there, which I think yeah, is definitely celebrate, but yeah. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, how about yourself, Chelsea? So Ore mentioned with, um, especially with HSPS, I can relate, you, we were able to some extent read more diverse, and this is obviously within the context of it's Cambridge still, we were able to read and kind of bring in more diverse um, lecturers or reading lists. But how about mm-hmm. you? Tell us what you studied and how that affected you within your course. Yeah, um, so at the beginning, yeah, I did forget to mention, so I studied history. 
which is interesting because I think when we have this conversation about imposter syndrome and decolonizing the curriculum, it does often focus on history as a topic, as a subject, um, but I think wider as well, and Aura touched on it, who's teaching the course? Um, moving further from that, who, who is in the room to maybe make these decisions as to what is put right. on the syllabus, as to who the lecturers get to be that year, for example. Um, but yeah, I think, again, Aura touched on a lot of, I think we can both agree, our, our same feelings. And I think a lot of the conversa conversation around imposter syndrome, you often feel starts with you. So when people talk about imposter syndrome, they're like, oh, but you know, you need to understand that you're deserving and you need to try and get over this and you need to do this and you need to do that. But when you go into an environment and there are literal physical markers telling you that you're an imposter, that's quite hard for you to think, right. okay, maybe this is something to do with me and maybe my own self-confidence and how I feel when actually everything around you is telling you something very different. Um, so I personally think that's something that extends beyond Cambridge. It's something that starts before it, will continue after it as well. Hence why I'm so reluctant to call Cambridge, Cambridge this bubble and, you know, university where things happen when actually when you leave, you're probably going to feel the exact same feeling just in right. different environments and in different spaces. Um, but again, I agree with Aura in terms of how we can get over imposter syndrome and focusing on the, on the question, why and what needs to be done as opposed to just being like this is bad this is bad this is bad actually what can we do so again the university they can listen they can talk to students and see how they feel which I think this conversation is testament we're talking about this now um, and yeah and I think just engaging with black students as well we've got amazing ideas but again yeah. at the same time we also have degrees we also want to enjoy our university experience it's it's a coin toss but if it's for the it's if it's for the betterment of other students yeah. i'm i'm sure yeah we're all here today yeah. talking about it and it's not just for us it's it's for everyone else yes definitely also, sorry just before no, you go, go that um an, another thing that cambridge as a university can do is not be afraid of setting a precedent if it's a good one right. and i i remember a lot of the conversations around the cockerel we were having at the time so this was in like 2015 2016 was all but you know other institutions and let's look at what all these other institutions are doing and all the museums and this and that whereas now where it seems kind of trendy for us to be talking about you know the importance of repatriation and taking down things and what they symbolize and and, and stuff everyone's fine with getting on board right and it's like a, a cute conversation now where it's like well actually we told you guys a couple of years ago that you should have done this ages ago but everyone was too scared to be the first one to take that step and I think Cambridge right. is a university that, and is an institution that globally sets good examples and it's, it's supposed to be pioneering. So I think it's, it, as an institution, Cambridge just needs to not be afraid to sometimes do the needful, even if it means being the first, even if it means stepping out of line, even if it means, you know, going the extra mile to stick your neck out for black students. If it requires you being the first, like go ahead and do it. Don't be afraid of setting precedent if it's a good one is I think something else I'd like to remind yeah. the university. No, such a good point. Such a good mm -hmm. point. And I think both of you mentioned the importance of listening, particularly to students um, and just to the people who can attest best to the Black student experience, which are Black students. And all of us were very involved with the ACS as vice presidents, presidents. With um, Black students, as we've said, having this experience where you already come to university and there's possibly, you could call it like the anxieties or the pressures and the fears of the unknown, just generally for any student. And then you come there with this awareness of your race, your class, your gender, um, your background and the environment that you now stand in and this new space. How do, and I guess you can speak to your own personal experiences, how do you then manage this fight for inclusion diversity while still as a young 18 year old teenager trying to adjust to a new environment as an individual especially with talks about you know pastoral care wellness um, mental health how did you guys tackle that throughout your degree and advice that you could give for the university um, and faculty to be able to support students in that specific area 
Yeah, I think for me, it's really interesting because when I first came to Cambridge, it was, for me, it was my class that was just massively, massively, massively took precedent. And it's really interesting. I think as soon as people hear that, they're like, all right, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So obviously your, your race wasn't a big issue then. And it's like, no, at the time, it was more my accent. It was how I approached situations. I didn't have much confidence. It was the school that I went to. I hadn't, I wasn't as well read as the majority of people who were, who were my, my peers. But it was very shortly after that, that I realized that, wow, actually, yes, there's the element of class, but my race complicates this so much more. And I think it's a hard thing to grapple with when you're young, you're 18, you've been fed from so many people that you're going to go to university and it will be the best experience of your life. You're going to have so much fun. Doesn't need to be said. You'll be taught by amazing people, academics, lecturers, but on the side, you've got this bubbling, something that's very institutionalized that actually no matter how much work you do, it it extends beyond you. It's something that's a lot bigger than you. And I think for a lot of us at uni, that wasn't something that you could ignore. It it was a necessity. It it was a case of, well, the only way to fix this is maybe one, how do we improve access to activism? We need to talk about these issues, but we also need to challenge them as well and criticize them. And that that is a necessity. And unfortunately, you know, the the being a black woman, that's something that's rooted in our in our being. We can't run away from these issues. When you look at me, you see I'm black and you see that I'm a woman. I can't run away from that. So my action, which I found was best, was that we have to tackle that head on in any way that I can. It, I, I don't necessarily have to be on the front line. But I'm going to do what I can do and what's in my power. But also at the same time, I have a degree. Yeah. <laughs> I need to graduate. How do I do that at the same time? So um, it was a fine balance, but it's something that's rooted in necessity. You, you, you have to, I think, which is quite sad, but also quite empowering. I love that. I think, like talking about the pastoral thing and like trying to actually just be an 18 year old is actually very important because we focus, and I think so much of these conversations focus so much on like, yes, as students, you're fighting for this and you're fighting for this and you mm. did this, and you're pushing for this, and you do, but it's like, oh, you don't have to do that. That shouldn't actually have to be our responsibility. Right. You know, I mean, it's helpful for the movements, and I think I, I'm glad that I get to serve my community in that kind of way but like I should never feel forced I should never feel like there's all this pressure on me to do all those things and I think also because of how hard um like we work to get to these spaces you're balancing this like guilt of not enjoying it you feel like oh I don't want to tell anyone I'm not enjoying it I don't want to tell anyone I'm actually having a really tough time I didn't tell my parents for ages that I was having a tough time because it was like well everyone's so proud of you everyone is so it's you don't 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 rock the boat too much. Like just, just, you'll be fine. Everything's going to be fine. Balancing that with like also this expectation that you should be grateful that you've been let into this space. So it's like, I was actually having a rough time. Like my, a lot of my first year was quite rough. I think I I talk in taking up space about how I said that until February of my first year, I felt that if I had died in my room, no one would have known. And Mm -hmm. that's not because everyone I met at Cambridge was a horrible person. I just hadn't made bonds that I felt like were actual I hadn't made like quality relationships yeah. that I felt like you know, there are people out here who have my back I hadn't built a support system I didn't have what felt like a real sense of community and that all changed for me when I found I mean I, I, I knew Chelsea but like when I found like the ACS and when I found other black kids that I felt like could all relate we all had this common shared experience of we're all finding it a bit rough but we don't really know how to talk about it without sounding like yeah. we're ungrateful for being here but you have to reframe that narrative. It's not about Cambridge letting us in. It's about recognizing that we earned our place there. And for as much as we worked as hard as the next person to earn that place there, we have equal right to enjoy that space. Definitely. Um, and to yeah. try to enjoy it and to, to, to benefit from it and to be able to, to take in all the experiences and all that it has to offer. And we can't, we can't perform our best selves unless you know, we're addressing the pastoral things and the welfare things and things to do with our mental health. So it involved like frank conversations it involved letting go of this idea that I had to be grateful to Cambridge for letting me in yeah uh, and that I, I that me not enjoying it and me having a bit of a tough time settling in was normal and that's where taking up space comes in to validate other people and their feelings of you know 
you might be going through this too, don't worry, we've been there. Um, we can tell you that they, there will be high, higher moments and there will be moments of joy and, you know, kind of sparkles um, as you go along. But it's okay, at least know that we've been through this too and it's okay yeah. if you feel yeah. like that. So yeah, sometimes yeah. that validation, just to remind everyone that we also have a right to enjoy that space too, but it's okay if sometimes we have it right. Right, right. Somebody's just asked in the Q&A chat, um, what is ACS? And I think that that would be a great thing to kind of segue into briefly, because both of, or not both of us, all three of us, like I said, have been involved with ACS quite heavily. Um, I know my myself and you all, um, you or that we are both on the board um currently and you know, we've occupied positions in presidents vps and so let's talk about how the university can best support acs explain what the acs is to people out there um and how the university can best support societies like the acs especially um on the front of dealing with diversity within the university mm. Yes, all right, and um, you, can, you can lead on that. So ACS stands for African Caribbean Society. And so it's a community, I mean, let me speak Cambridge ACS, yes, it's a community of African and Caribbean, students of African and Caribbean descent. Um, so obviously that means we are mostly black. And um, we have, it was a variety of things. We would have lots of fun, kind of just fun events, just to bond and we would also have like access events try and get more black people into Cambridge um, and it's great that we can all sit here and say that three years since we've left there's almost three times as many black students as were there when we matriculated yeah. massive deal and it's not just the work of the ACS but like those are the kinds of things that we work towards um, it's also um, a space where I personally found a lot of real refuge and I thought that oh my gosh there are no black people in Cambridge and then I went to my first ACS event in November and met a whole bunch of people in fact I only one of my um, best friends who I've taken from Cambridge she the only reason we became friends was because she heard about an ACS event I didn't know about an ACS event and she was like you should come and that's how our friendship has lit literally blossomed so it's a very like important support system for us now in terms of how the university can support us um Supporting our events and stuff that we do is definitely important. I mean, access conferences we were running at the time, we were having to find sponsors on our own. We were having to find that support on our own and hold them externally. Um, and it takes a lot of time alongside your degree to raise all that money. And it was yeah. all for a good cause. And it, there were great skills that we learned, but I think there were definitely ways that university, the university could be more supportive. And they are, you know, I'm seeing the Cambridge ACS conference now on the, the Cambridge YouTube channel and all kinds yeah. of things conversations being being had which I think is really good but I think also um sometimes there are fears for um, black students in like ACS spaces and deciding whether or not oh do you hang out with ACS too much or like am I assimilating enough am I mingling enough like did I really just come here only to meet black people and then you start having this whole like oh uh like I need to make other friends and things and then yeah. and feeling a, a bit weird and I think Sometimes it's just about giving us permission to like hold that space and just reminding us that it's okay and it's something worthy of celebrating that you have this shared heritage and this shared culture that, you know, is, is unique to you guys and that you get to bond over. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes you would have events like get shut down or like we'd have people looking weirdly and asking weird questions because you haven't seen this many black people get together in Cambridge ever. Um, but I think as the ACS grows, more of that is being normalized um, and you said something about diversity within ACS, which I think is important. With taking up space, we wanted to make sure that we had lots of people's experiences represented. So we, it's not just a book about Chelsea and I's experiences. We have contributors who we spoke to and interviewed extensively for the book. And the whole point is to show that even though we found real refuge in the ACS, it's not necessarily for everyone. Don't right. feel this pressure that you have to be a part of this, this group. Some people love it, some people didn't and had their issues with it, but found other spaces that worked for them. Um, and I think, you know, that balance and reminding people that even though we do have shared experiences to an extent, we have, you know, shared cultures and shared heritage, it doesn't mean we're the same people. It doesn't mean that we, all our likes converge and that we right. will constantly get along at all times. And we can't assume that ever um, because that's very reductive and, you know, we don't assume that about white people, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, so I think ACS is great for me, but remember that there is a diversity within the black experience that should also right. be celebrated and welcomed. Um, and yeah, that's it. Amazing. Chelsea, did you want to contribute anything? I mean, I think she said most of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think in terms of, I remember when, uh, I think you two were on the same committee. So I actually wasn't on ACS committee. So from somebody who was just a member and wasn't on the board, it was exactly the same. I think ACS was so important as a refuge. Um, but I don't know, also at the same time, I was probably a little bit similar to the students who were like, okay, I want to have ACS and I'd never deny that, that part of my university experience. But I also was part of my football club. I did athletics. I do some history things on the side. It was really important that I was meeting all different types of people. But I loved ACS. Like ACS was so important for me because you very rarely get a group of people who you don't even have to speak and they know exactly what you're going through. Definitely. And I think that that was something that was really special and you couldn't really replicate that anywhere else. Um, but yeah, I, I think in terms of how the university can support, I like Ara mentioned, they are doing their bit now, um, just giving it a bit more prominence um, and also using the ACS as a resource. But I think most importantly, understanding that for a lot of students, that is a place where they can just escape so maybe don't always impose yourself and be like oh what's the ACS doing now what are they doing next what's but sometimes students just want to chill and not do anything yeah. you know not everything is like a big move or a big thing we just want to in one group have a chat have a conversation and that's it so yeah. I think respecting the space but also yeah understanding the ways in which you can support from a distance or get more involved and you know let there be a working relationship between the two because yeah great things could come out of that right so those are such great responses about ACS and what it's like being a part of that society and depending on how close or how involved you want to be how it can affect and shape your university experience but that's pretty much within university and I know yourself Chelsea you did um coming from a state background similar to myself you also did a lot of access work with the main university um with like summer programs and things like that so I wanted to ask what more or what better could the university and institutions like Cambridge do to assist state schools um, and schools in general to help improve the transition and also the application process or for those applying to Cambridge, how they perceive Cambridge and I guess make that transition into this, this new space and this new world. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's so interesting because I remember in my first year I was involved in, I think Cambridge were just launching something called the Alternative Prospectus, where I remember when my school had to get the prospective, Prospectus for Cambridge delivered just for me so I could have a look and stuff. Um, and I remember looking at all of the information, I thought, wow, this is so overwhelming. I don't even know what a college is. I don't know what all of these words mean. Um, but then I remember getting involved in this project with the alternative prospectus in that it was coming from the mouths and the voices of students. They would tell you things like, oh, you know, the toilets are really nice in this college or the gardens are really pretty here. And I thought, wow, that's, that's just really accessible. Um, but I think in terms of the transition, and this, this has made me realise that it extends way beyond just the student. I mean, if there's anything, and I think this is the one thing I would possibly not knock about Cambridge and their access initiatives, they do very well. And I do think that they invest a lot of money and time into their access in initiatives as well. So it's now it's just about reach. And who are you reaching? Are you reaching students? I think a lot more could maybe be done to reach parents, for example. My mum and dad didn't have a clue about the university system. But if they were able to maybe you know, have a navigation or find a way as to how they could best support me when I'm going through this massive transition in my life that would have helped massively. But also teachers as well, support staff, everyone around the student, I think could definitely use that little bit of help or just top tips or hints or facts. I mean, I remember when I was preparing for my interview, I was a mess. I was an absolute mess, just in terms mm. of, I didn't really know what I was doing, but 
I just thought oh, I'm just going to give this my best shot. I was Googling every single little thing. I was on the student room every 10 minutes and nothing was, was very, very streamlined. Yeah. So I think if you can just have steps and stepping stones to help people understand the process a bit more, demystify the process as well, because yeah, it's a big deal, but it's actually not that bad. Like right. you, you want to go in and you want to put your best foot forward and be confident. But in the back of my head, I was thinking, uh, you know, should I wear my glasses or should I not wear my glasses? Will I look smart if I wear my glasses? Will I look weird? Do I wear business wear? Do I wear jeans? Right. And I was thinking about all those things when actually I didn't really get to enjoy the interview experience and mm -hmm. know that I'd be sitting with somebody who was a top academic in their field and they were really interested in, in hearing my opinion, which I didn't necessarily get all the time being in a class of 30, 35. Like that's such a unique experience. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, if, bit of a ramble, but if you take anything away from that, yeah, anything to just demystify the process and help everyone around the student will, will be really, really helpful. Yeah, that's so spot on. How about you, Aura? You were equally as involved in access work. Yeah, um, I, I was involved in access work, but was kind of doing it out of, I mean, I didn't go to state school, like I went to a private school that actually, I think did do quite a bit of work to prepare me, like I had my mock interviews and things. But for me, it was just because I had had a good experience doesn't mean I shouldn't be putting in the work to make mm -hmm. sure that all the people who didn't have a good experience applying or didn't have enough support applying, didn't get the help that they needed and deserved. Um, so I think for me, it was just about, and I think this is a lesson that we can transfer like across, not just in terms of race, but also in terms of class, like how can you use your privilege? Like going to private, private school, I have to recognize that that did give me some re relative privilege. And the way I decided to make good use of that was to get involved in access programs. I think um, what Chelsea said was spot on about also, it's not just about supporting schools, it's also about supporting home environments. I yeah. also had, apart from a school support system, I had very encouraging parents who were pushing me. In fact, I talk a lot about how my dad was even over supportive in that he told people I was going to Cambridge before I even got this offer. Like that's <laughs> how confident, that's how much um, he believed in me. And having that behind me, whether or not I got in, they were gonna be proud of me regardless, but yeah. knowing that that was what was pushing me was very, very important. So I think what um, the university does with schools is great, but I think we also, and, and we say taking up space as a book is for everyone because we also need parents to be involved in the conversation. What are your friends saying as well? You know, I mean, luckily I also had a great support group of friends, but some people don't. Some people are like, why are you, why are you trying to apply there? Why are you aiming there? Um, mm. And it's about, you know, just kind of making sure that everyone gets involved in this conversation. You all have a role to play. It's not just about the schools and the teachers. They can only do so much. Um, so it's about getting everyone involved. And I think I just stressed that when we talk about access. Right, that's, that's so good. Those responses are literally spot on. I think with access, a lot, like mentioned earlier, a lot has actually been done, especially since we've left. I think we've been able to like yeah. leave university and kind of look back and think, wow, so many things are changing. I remember seeing a picture of like the ACS and I remember we took one when we were there and I was like, oh yeah, like this crowd of people was like, oh, it's so much bigger than how much it was 10 years ago. And then like two years after that, you look at one and it's like loads of people and you're thinking, you wow, like, anymore. can't, exactly, yeah. can't even fit in Nando's anymore. And that's, uh, that's a true testament to the power of access work, especially when the university comes together with black students and really, like you said, listens to them and allows them to lead that work, but puts their resources and their efforts behind it. And somebody has actually um, put a question and kind of a comment, which is that whilst we've been making, and I guess we've seen since um, like the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement as of recent, there have been surveys, there have been questionnaires, there have been reports put out. And I think you see this about Cambridge all the time. There are loads of media, articles it seems every year diversity is so bad there's no black students there's like two people and um we've seen all the reports about how bad it is but really it just comes down to like you said Chelsea let's ask the question as to why is it this bad if it is and what can we do and as the comment says put our action behind it 
Um, and it really is about action. So you guys took the action of writing, taking up space. <laughs> and um, this is such an amazing book. Anyone who hasn't read it, you need to go and grab your copy. Um, but with taking up space, what were your, I, I think you touched on it a bit, but really tell us what were your goals for the book? Um, and, and what did you want people to get from it? And what has the response been to the book since you released it? Okay, so I think one of our, in fact, not one of our, our primary goal was always to make black girls just feel validated in all the experiences that they have. So much of the, our time at Cambridge, we felt like we were doing it alone like oh okay you might find a friend who agrees with you who's going through the same thing but, but ultimately it felt like we were doing it alone so I think this book is just kind of to offer like a kind of sister friend situation like don't worry we've been there like you're going to be fine you're going to come out the other end, other end and you're going to be okay but as kind of like a secondary goal I think it was just so that everyone gained insight into what it is like to be a black girl in this kind of space at a top UK university, at a predominantly white university. And so many of our experiences are transferable even beyond just universities as a space. So I think it was just about giving everyone else insight. And a lot of the response from non-black women or just from people who are not black women um, has been around, oh my goodness, I did not realize this. Or oh my goodness, I didn't think about it this wow. way. I didn't know the stats were this bad. I didn't realize how that might have affected you. Um, and it's, it's an eye-opening, I think, very insightful read for people who are not black women or who don't necessarily share our experience, but have a role to play in either contributing to making that experience worse and can play a role in alleviating it. So I think it's just about that kind of, you know, it, it works twofold in that way. But our primary goal was for black girls. We just wanted them to feel seen. We wanted them to be able to identify with at least one of the people in the book. Um, and that was really important to us. And then everyone else just, we hope that you read it and you get so kind of angry that you are inspired to act, to do more, to serve black girls better and to, um, yeah, just see, see how you can better support the black women that are around you. So yeah, it's a call to action, of course, I think. Love it. How about you, Chelsea? Tell us about your author experience and yeah, your experience with taking up space. Yeah, I think Aura touched on it and on her last point. I think for us, it was not even igniting a conversation, but reigniting a conversation in that people have been talking about this for very long, very, right. very, very long. Like we're definitely not the first, but I think what was different about taking up space was that we collated all of this information, all of these experiences, stats, facts with our own personal experiences and representations and put it all into one place and I think for a lot of people they found that very insightful and I think again it just hit home for again a lot of people that wow this is actually something that's really bad why is no one nobody talking about this but also what can we do and I think what I mentioned it was a call to action I think for me especially I just wanted people to have a sense of urgency that this is something that's happening now as we speak, a whole new cohort of people have just started at university. There are gonna be young black girls who are going through the same experiences, anxieties that we felt when we joined university. And that's something Definitely. that hasn't, like not much has changed with that. Apart from the fact that, I guess some things are more accessible. For example, our book is there, that, that can be used as a resource. You've got, again, people who, do, who speak out about these things, which I'd say all of us, we all do things like that. That's probably the difference, but that innate and inherent feeling doesn't necessarily go away. Um, so yeah, I think for me, the author experience, it was good. It was, it was important. I felt like I was doing something really important and that would, even if it helped one person, that was enough for me because right. I know for a fact, if I had read something similar or even just a passage, a chapter in maybe like my first year or my second year, even in my third year, I would have been like, wow, okay, so I'm not the only one. Yeah. I can rest. Like I can, I can, you know, move on and understand that this is something that's felt not just within Cambridge or Oxford, it's up and down the country. So yeah, call to action. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good way to summarize yeah. it. Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. So I'm going to head to some of the Q&A questions that we've received. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can get through as many as possible. So um, obviously, taking up space is 
I think it's the first murky book publication. Yes, first independent. Yeah, first independent. Mm. Amazing. Mm. Well done. Um, so you. what are your <laughs> thoughts on the Stormzy scholarship and what does it mean or what does that scholarship and I guess that historical moment, if you want to call it that, mean for Black students and for diversity and inclusion? Yeah, so I think with the Stormzy scholarship, so I was involved in its, in its very early stages um, before it was rolled out, but I think for me, it's mass just massively important. And I think it's really important, again, that people realise that this isn't Stormzy who has come along and he's reserved two spaces for black students and they will get this, this scholarship money and everything is, you know, dandy. It is a case of people, again, changing the narrative. These two students, they have earned their place. They've got the grades. They've worked just as hard as everyone else. They've earned their place. And they're now in a position whereby they get help financially. Right. But I think what's really important as well, and I, I definitely never shy from this criticism, is that Stormzy aside, and what he's done is brilliant and amazing, celebrities and you know people who do have a high profile shouldn't have to step in for, and to essentially fill the gaping holes that maybe access work could mm. help to mend, maybe not as fast as a huge grant scholarship, but something that is longevity, something that is long and has longevity. Also something where you can hold the university to account, for example. So I would never, never, ever knock the scholarship because I think, like I mentioned before, these are issues that need solving now. Those two students, they now have the opportunity to enjoy their university experience. I know that for me, finances was quite a big thing and I worried about that quite a lot. In my first year, I'd go back and work um, at my part-time job during the holidays. Mm -hmm. That wasn't time for me to maybe read or chill in the garden and stuff. I had to go and work because I knew that by the time I got back to uni, I'd be broke. So I think that just takes off an extra burden but I do think overall it is a hugely positive thing and hopefully something that continues for a long while. Um, but yeah, massively positive, I would say. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Aura? I think Chelsea has said it all, let me not lie. It's just another great <laughs> example of someone using their relative privilege and actually helping the community. It's never something that you have to do, but yeah. if you really do have that opportunity and you have those things at your disposal, like you mm -hmm. can, um, then you should be. Yeah. yeah good use of his privilege i think great, great. good yeah definitely definitely so um as we've mentioned there were positive and negative experiences whilst at cambridge just the whole mix of emotions um over those few years but if um there is anything you could have done differently during your time at university what would it have been so i don't know you know i actually think I always say sometimes I don't think regrets are healthy. So I try not to dwell right. on things before, like what could I have done? What could I not have done? Um, and I really do think I did my best in terms of trying to make lots of friends from everywhere. Um, but I had a bit mm -hmm. of a realization the other day that I don't have many non-black friends that I made at Cambridge. And this is really weird because, not weird, but it's not something I would have expected going in because from secondary school, I have friends from everywhere. But Cambridge was just, tough in that sense and by the time I got to second year I think the last of the non-black friends that I had I kind of lost it by then um I talking taking up space about how I lost this um student election and it was a big deal for me um and I'm sure some people think oh I'm probably just being bitter because I lost the election but it had a lot to do with understanding how people who might seem to be your friends still think that they for some reason cannot see you in a certain leadership role and right. I think I've lost a lot of trust and I just I think I really closed off by the time I was in final year and I just didn't really want to give anyone kind of outside of my community and my like circle of trust a chance um and so sometimes I ask myself whether or not I could have done more to make sure that I had friends from everywhere but I think by the time I got to third year I was just so much more like I have to prioritize my mind and my self-care my mental health and I, it feels like I've put in a lot of work to try and be friends with people and who ultimately have let me down in a very peculiar kind of way. And I cannot put my finger on why I know that there is something wrong and racially charged with this, but it doesn't sit right with me. And I ended up leaving Cambridge with probably one 
good and he's great but one great non-black friend <laughs> which is crazy okay. <laughs> but fair enough and I think that's something that even I relate to as well like I would say I wish I had made more friends whilst I was at university I was able to make friends with so many different people but having diverse friends and I think it did lead it was led up to the whole like imposter syndrome thing where you just feel like I'm just trying to make sure I'm okay and that like people don't discover that I'm basically a fraud so I don't really have the time to speak to everyone like my mental capacity is really at its max but um how about yourself Chelsea if there's anything that you could do differently what would it be oh differently I think for me when I came in I just wasn't confident I was really nervous about everything again anxieties about stuff but also I always thought like oh, these people are so much smarter than me my my mm. who cares about my opinions or who cares about my thoughts so I I think I'm very much a listener any anyway but I remember in first year I really just used to sit back and just let other people speak which I didn't mind but I think actually half of the time I had the same thoughts or if not probably a little bit better <laughs> a bit more right. refined so I'd say have confidence it sounds so cliche but it does take you a long way and I think it opens you up to different conversations and it you meet new people through it as well just being a bit you know sticking your neck out a bit I think I think mm. does help amazing amazing so in this thing that we've mentioned quite a few times privilege how can non-black students and academics use their privilege or join the fight against racism, institutional racism, and to better improve um, access and inclusion at university? Um, oh, sorry, all right. I, I had a great director of studies. Um, his name was Duncan Kelly. Shout out to Duncan. Duncan was a legend. And he was a great listener. And I would come to him with issues of, I want to study this and it's not my curriculum. I want to study this, it's not my curriculum. I wanted to do more of this and you're only letting me do one essay on it. And he would listen and he would really listen and he would take the things that I would say to him and have conversations with them and he would take them higher. So at the end of the day, him being a director of studies, he's in a position to take these conversations further. And mm -hmm. what I try and say to non-black people, and this is to, to, uh, to students and staff alike, but I think particularly for academics, this is where you might be able to help. What are you saying when we're not in the room? How are you taking the conversations that we have with you further? So that we can, and, and like our voices are kind of like, you know, we can stand on your shoulders and then more people can hear us. And I just mm -hmm. kind of see it as, you know, Duncan being my director of studies was one person who really took my matter on his case. Like he really said, look, and he, he told me, honestly, like, I don't think you can do this dissertation. I want to do a dissertation about Nigeria's power sector. And there's no one in the university who specializes in West Africa, let alone Nigeria. And I, I couldn't find the support I needed. And he told me very frankly, like, you can try, but you're not going to get support you need. Best case scenario, you'll find someone who maybe specializes in, in another, oil, um, another oil, oil exporting country, but you're not going to find someone who specializes in Nigeria. And I just thought, if all that we can say for our politics department and what we study in African politics is a bit of Zimbabwe here, a bit of South Africa yeah. here, and maybe if you're lucky, a little bit of Ghana. I'm sorry, but that's, that's not good enough. In 2020, yeah. that's not, he, he made, made sure that even if there wasn't anything that he could actively do, he could keep the conversation going. And I just think mm. a lot of non-black staff, that's where it begins. You need to be making the noise and shaking the tables in the rooms where we aren't in. Um, right. And that's you can do that by carrying the conversation on definitely how about yourself Chelsea mm. yeah I was gonna say exactly the same as well like alongside carrying on the conversation what's being said when we're not in the room because I guarantee I think for a lot of people and just table talk as well that's often when you hear people's truest and most yeah. frankest thoughts and so I think for me you really alongside that you do also want to engage with the people that you know with the black students that you know um but also just be a good friend like check up on them it doesn't necessarily have to be oh my god you are black are you okay but like oh you know <laughs> how you, how are you getting on today you, how was your lecture how yeah. how have your supervisions been do you want to grab a coffee do you want to catch up I think I had a lot of friends black or not black who were just very good at doing that just being a good friend and 
knowing that I had them in my corner or if I wanted to rant or go go off about something they were always there to just listen yeah. as a good friend does or as somebody who is generally understanding um but yeah I think what I said probably is the main and the most important point just talking for us when we're not there like right. again not talking over us but when we're not in the room but on. what can you say <laughs> what can you say to support and to help yeah. Yeah, that final point is so, it's so important because, and, and somebody, help, somebody else has actually asked this question in the Q&A, which is, which is more beneficial, um, ex, non-black or non-white people, sorry, um, especially I guess in this case, black students forming their own spaces to kind of fight this cause or having white people, people of whatever race and whatever background as academics and students all fighting this cause which one is more beneficial and I think it, it's obviously there's power in numbers and there's power in people who have the access and the privilege and are in the spaces who may not be experiencing this problem to fight for the problem to be solved um, but I think it's really important as you've emphasized to make sure that just because you have the most power or the most access or the most privilege don't assume that you know all about this problem and you can fix it single-handedly because actually the best people to talk to you about bettering the black experience is black students and they're going to need to be allowed to speak and um, we already make our own spaces um, and oftentimes we have to put in our own resources our own time take mm -hmm. time out of your degree even fund your own society and your own um events and stuff like that we we've been putting in the work to create our own spaces but now yeah. it's the university or whoever whatever the institution is putting their resources there to amplify that and to solve it um ultimately so that's such a great point to emphasize yeah. so i think another thing that keeps oh actually this is a good question how has life been as young black women post university Gosh. Gosh. All right, okay. you can go because you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, well, do you know what? What I think is quite interesting with both of us is that we've both done some sort of postgraduate education after. And all right, I know what you were saying in terms of you felt like you didn't make many non-black friends at Cambridge. When you went to Columbia, I feel like you made so many non-black friends, right? So I think... Yeah. I obviously did the GDL and the LPC. I was at the University of Law and I had like a really good experience. And I'm not too sure if that was coming out of Cambridge and knowing that I was no longer in that environment, one, but also two, I was back in London, for example. Mm -hmm. That makes a massive difference. I was back at home again. I had my home friends as, alongside people that I'd met at university, but also I knew that I was doing my it, it was essentially training in preparation for for this um training contract so i think my experience after was very different but particularly as a young black woman i'm quite lucky in the sense that i'm surrounded by a lot of other really successful lovely friendly supportive other young black women as well and i think that's that's made life a lot easier just being able to know that I can Amazing. go to different people and, and just talk about things. Um, yeah. So I'd, I'd say it's been fine. I'm having a good time. <laughs> love that. Love that. I, I'm so upset that I've left this question till so late. And I know Aura has loads of stories she could tell. So Aura, tell us about <laughs> your, um, your experiences post-university. Yeah. Um, but it's probably going to be the last question that we can answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I went to Columbia, which was good fun. I think I, I wanted a switch up, like the prospect of going to America, I think was very glamorized in my head, to be honest. It wasn't, New York is not like what they show you in Sex and City, just FYI, especially not if you're a struggling student, but <laughs> it was still really, really good fun. And I, I, I had a very, very diverse cohort and I really, really, really loved that. Like I loved that 50% of us were international students and I yeah. had friends from everywhere and it really felt like this massive melting pot. And I think because of how much Cambridge contrasted and paled in that sense. I really took everything at Columbia on. Like I, I, I was just so happy. I was like, bring it all, bring it all. Um, so Columbia was really, really great fun. And, and journalism and the skills that I learned there were great. 
Um, and my current job, I also love, and it has come off of the back of taking up space. So it's great that, and I'm so grateful to God and just, it's, it's crazy the way things work that I'm now in literally the job that I have dreamt of and didn't think was going to happen this soon, but hey, um, and yeah, so it's been, it's been good. Um, in many ways, some of the issues that we experienced at Cambridge have still followed us, mm. but it's okay. It's okay. We're finding new ways to deal with them and you get stronger. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Yes, you do. You ladies are absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you to Cambridge for having us and this amazing conversation. Um, and yeah, have an amazing evening. Be sure to connect with everybody and tell us where we connect. Keep we can connect yes. with uh, you ladies and anything that you have coming up. Um, oh, we have um, at Taking Up Space book on Instagram and at Taking Up Space BK on Twitter. You can find us. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram personally as well. Amazing. Yeah. Chelsea? Yeah, so to just to echo Aura, and then you can follow us personally. It's just our, our name. So I'm Chelsea Kwachi. And then Ores is Ore Agumbi. Perfect, perfect. You can yeah. find me anywhere, um, Courtney Daniela. And yeah, have an amazing evening. Thank you all so much for joining this webinar. Thank you to Cambridge once again for having us. And I look forward to seeing the amazing things that you ladies will be bringing to us real soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.